Awarded the Pulitzer Prize for her novel, A Thousand Acres, Jane Smiley is also the author of five works of nonfiction and a series of books for young, uh, young adults. Please join me in welcoming Jane Smiley. Book 18. Michael was still bigger than he was, but not much. 6'3", 170 versus 6'3 and a half, 175. If he caught Michael unawares, he could still knock him down, but he hadn't done that in a year. Now they mostly ignored each other. Michael liked the kinks. Richie liked Black Sabbath. That was all a person need to, needed to know. Anyway, now he was in Boston, and here was the bus that was taking him to where he would go through the physical and the tests, whatever they were. He was the first to get on, and he walked to the back and sat down. It was a nice July day, sunny but damp, a Boston day, not like that armpit in the Midwest where they sweated all day and night. It was a week since he'd walked out of the job that his dad had gotten him painting at a country club, though it didn't look very exclusive to Richie. They painted green some days, and they painted white other days, and the painters talked about whorehouses and tattoos. Now Richie stared out the window at guys in uniforms, telling the recruits to move it, get going. Finally, the sergeant followed the last guy onto the bus, and the door started to close. One of the draftees jumped out of his seat and said, we need to vote on that. The sergeant said, sit down. The kid didn't sit down. In fact, Richie saw the kid was older than the sergeant. He said, America is still a democracy. This bus will move when the people have decided it will move. <laughs> Men, he turned toward the guys in the seats. Everyone who wants the door to close, say, I. Richie shouted, I. There were maybe five or six eyes. No, no, the whole bus erupted. The kid said, I think we need to debate this. Parliamentary procedures apply. The sergeant said, sit down. The kid went right up to him and put his arm around the sergeant's waist and pushed into him slightly. He maybe outweighed the sergeant by 20 pounds. He said in a calm voice, let's have a debate, all right. He kept his arm around the sergeant, kept pushing into him until the sergeant backed toward the driver and shrugged. The debate about closing the door and then about driving away lasted 20 minutes. Richie participated. He made the case against blocking traffic. When the sergeant sat down, the kid sat down right beside him. It was clear who was the boss. When the bus pulled up at the facility, the door opened and an older man got on, also a sergeant, but a lifer. The bus went dead quiet. This sergeant handed out cards and pencils. They had to write down their names, birth dates, and some other information. When, when everyone just sat there, the sergeant pretended to get mad and said, move it. The kid stood up. Sit down, shouted the sergeant. The kid said, it is moved by the sergeant here that I sit down. Second the motion, a hand went up. What the? All in favor? A few, a few eyes, not Richie. Richie wanted to see what might happen. All opposed, the bus roared. The sergeant shouted, son, if you don't sit down, I'll sit you down. The kid said, motion made to sit me down by force. Second, a hand went up. All in favor? As everyone in the bus shouted, aye, the sergeant pushed the kid into his seat. But he popped up to exclaim, motion carried. Everyone laughed. Now they scribbled. But when the sergeant told them to pass their pencils forward, they all threw their pencils right at him. He had to duck. By the time they had debated and voted for getting off the bus, even he looked a little intimidated, though red-faced and angry. Richie didn't know what to think. Once inside the building, they were told to line up. <clears throat> Richie suspected that he was between two guys who knew each other, though they didn't look, back, look or talk to each other. For a while, things went along, no debates or votes. The chairman of the bus was five guys ahead of Richie, and the only thing he did was try to engage every doctor or orderly he met in conversation. Was Dr. So-and-so aware that 68% of American voters no longer favored the war in Vietnam? How did Dr. This and That personally feel about the invasion of Cambodia? Had Dr. Up and Down known Lieutenant Callie personally, 
And was he present at the My Lai massacre? This last was said in a smooth and friendly voice. Keep it moving, was all the army people said. But it moved very slowly because it seemed like it took everyone in the line at least a minute to unlace each shoe and unbutton each button. Richie thought that the army personnel were pretty patient. They came to a large room and were told to strip down to their underwear, put their clothes into a basket and stay in line. It was then that he saw that the kid in front of him had painted black skulls with red eyes on his chest and his back with the words U.S. Army across his collarbones. The kid behind him had a bomb blast on his back. The line moved and the doctors kept their eyes down. The chairman, still five ahead, had a map of Cambodia on his back and the words, next stop, Peking. They shuffled along very slowly. At one point, the front group paused. Richie could see the first guy come to a doctor sitting on a stool. He turned his head to the right and coughed, then to the left and coughed. He stood there. A few minutes later, when Richie got a better view, he saw that each kid was dropping his pants and the doctor was sticking his finger up into the kid's scrotum. They shuffled forward. Finally, the chairman came to the doctor sitting on the stool. The doctor's assistant muttered something and the chairman said, please repeat your request. Take your pants down. Pardon? Je ne comprends pas. The doctor and his assistant had changed, exchanged a glance and then the doctor said, Bessez votre slip, toot sweet. And the kid dropped his pants. Everyone clouded, cr crowded close to have a look. Painted on his chest was an arrow pointing downward and affixed to the tip of his cock was a photograph cut from a magazine of President Nixon. <laughs> Everyone laughed and even the doctor cracked a tiny smile. Richie had been told that processing would take a couple of hours, but it was mid-afternoon by the time they were back on the bus, so it had taken six hours and 15 minutes. He was tired and he was glad that the yippies, because that's what they were, let the bus go back into town. It dropped them at the recruiting office. Richie didn't quite know what to do next. He had thought somehow that the back door of the facility would open onto a platform and all the ones who had passed their physicals would get on a train or a bus to Fort Dix. From there, he would call home and tell them what he had done. But now he was in Boston, not far from Kenmore Square with some change in his pocket and he was 17 years old and he didn't know what to do. Then there's a little pause. So Richie's cousin, um, uh, the eldest, daughter of Lillian is named Debbie and she was born in uh, 1948 and she lives in Boston. Debbie didn't go to Kenmore Square very often. <clears throat> Normally she stopped, shopped at Coolidge Corner and enjoyed herself in Cambridge. Her new boyfriend went to Harvard Business School and she did seem to remember her la he did seem to remember her last name and to think she was pretty and fun. He respected her principles. He was from Lincoln, Nebraska, where apparently they also had principles and thought Iowans were a little untrustworthy. He made Debbie laugh. But Debbie's dentist's office was right across from those shops on Beacon Street. She was standing in front of the case, looking at the sausage, when a guy bumped into her, and she looked up to scowl at him. She could have sworn it was her cousin Richie, though taller and without Michael, which never happened. She put aside the thought, but then he ordered a ham sandwich, <coughs> and the voice was Richie's too, Richie's and Uncle Frank's. When he took his sandwich and went to pay, she followed him. He couldn't have walked more like Uncle Frank, so when he was, <coughs> when he was out on the street, she said, Richie, and he spun around. <coughs> he hugged her. He had never hugged her since he was about four years old and told, and told to do so. He had a beautiful grin. And Debbie had to admit that she was a little dazzled. It was when he shoved the whole second half of his sandwich into his mouth at once that she realized he was starving and not in Boston on a school trip or something. She adopted her best teacherly demeanor, at least it worked with the eighth graders she was teaching now, and said, OK, Richie, what is going on here? And as they hiked up Beacon Street, 
towards Coolidge Corner. He told her the whole story about walking away from his job, coming to Boston, joining the army, falling into a whirlpool of yippies. No one has any idea where you are? I don't know. This sounded sullen. Where have you been staying? Well, I had some money because I got paid Friday. It was a hotel on Copley Square, but I ran out of money, so I checked out of that hotel. I thought I'd be in the army by now, but they just let us all go, even the non-yippies, because I guess they were fed up. At her place, she called her mom first, but there was no answer. It was 5.30, maybe they were just outside. Then with Richie's permission, she called Aunt Andy, that's Richie's mom, but no answer there either. Richie said, <clears throat> what day is it? Tuesday, uh, Nedra's day off. Do you want me to call your dad's office? They've gone home. If they're looking for you, you have no idea where they are or what they're doing. I'm sure Michael told them some story. What story could he tell them? Hmm, I fell in the river and there's no point in dredging because I was washed out to sea. Debbie said, you guys, everyone would know, everyone would know he was joking, right? It could be pretty convincing, said Richie. Richie went into the bathroom. She felt a little protective of Richie without Michael, even at 6'3", or whatever he was, he seemed vulnerable. When he came out of the bathroom, she asked him if he wanted to go out for a pizza. She had two pieces, he had six, and two Cokes, and she didn't have to pry. He was not like Tim had been, secretive about every little thing. He told her about school. He'd been busted down to Corporal twice for fighting with Michael, but then he had made a friend of his own from Little Rock, Greg, who was a swimmer. Richie turned out to be a better swimmer than a runner, and he had gotten, in on a, gotten on the varsity swim team. He said he and Greg practiced all the time, and his butterfly was really fast. He'd won six races over the winter. Greg was also good at math and helped Richie bring his grade up to A+, plus, and so he'd been promoted back to sergeant by the end of the year. The kids who hung around with Michael stopped teasing Greg when Richie punched one of them so hard he fell flat down, and Michael refused to punch Richie out, saying that if a guy couldn't take care of himself, it wasn't Michael's job to take care of him. So a truce for, the most, of the, for most of the spring, ready to be promoted in the fall, and supposedly off to West Point or the Naval Academy or something like that, but why wait, thought Richie. You can't be in favor of the Vietnam War, said Debbie. The undercurrent of their conversation for her was Tim, Tim, Tim. Tim is her older brother who was killed in Vietnam. But maybe Richie didn't perceive this. He would have been, what, 13 was Tim when, when Tim was killed. She knew from her job that 13-year-olds were lost in outer space. Why not, said Richie. The president was elected. He's the commander in chief. He knows more about it than I do. His job is to know stuff that I don't know. That's why he ordered the invasion of Cambodia. Those college kids who were shutting down campuses and, and, and rioting and stuff are just lazy and don't want to fight. Debbie felt a little pop of anger, but pressed her lips closed around that reference to Tim that she was about to make, reminding herself that Richie had been in military school for three years. She only said, I guess they feel differently about it at military schools than at liberal arts colleges. My dad fought in World War II. He's not, he's not sorry. Well, what does he think about the war in Vietnam? He thinks it's us or them. Oh, said Debbie, I didn't know that. What does your dad think? Debbie shook her head. I don't think anyone will ever know. And then she must have looked sad because Richie, Richie actually reached across the table and patted her on the shoulder and then said, Uncle Arthur is the most fun of any grown-up that ever lived. After that, he said, I thought Tim was our family's version of Superman. Back in her apartment, she still could not reach Aunt Andy, and so she made up her mind. Okay, Richie, I'm going to give you a train fare back to New York, and then you get yourself to Englewood and just walk in the door. Do you have a key? He nodded. Best thing to do is show up and see what they say. Answer your, their questions honestly, but don't offer any extra information. My bet is they'll be so glad to see you that they'll lay off after a day or so. Also, also. Give your mom a big hug every so often and tell her you missed her and leave it at that. 
Did you give the Army your home address? Well, yes, there were cards and stuff. Well, my boyfriend says that the Yippies are really successful here because there are so many kids who can be drafted. If you give them trouble, then they just cross you off the list and go on to somebody else. I don't want to be crossed off the list. Yes, you do. At least finish high school. He nodded. She got him off early the next morning, dragging his suitcase, which he had left in a locker in the st at the station the morning he went for the physical. She made him take a shower, so only his clothes stank, but really it was amazing what 17-year-old boys did not notice. Of course he didn't write, but a week later she got a letter from her mother. <clears throat> Dear Debbie, it's been terribly hot here. I hope you're getting some sea breezes. When you come home for Labor Day weekend, you can revive us if you feel like it. Listen to this. Richie was gone for six days. He showed up Wednesday evening and he said nothing. Well, your Aunt Andy was very upset, so she went into his room and got all over him and he said, didn't she get his note? And of course not. Apparently a friend of his from school had come east for a week and they decided to drive around and look at colleges since the boy had never been east before. They went to Annapolis and West Point and Penn just to have a look. I guess Richie had money from his job. Then he showed her the note he'd left for her, taped it to the bar in the family room, but now she stopped drinking so she never even opened the bar and never saw it. Frank thought it was a sign of manly independence that they did this, so he isn't mad. Wonders never cease, and I'm talking about the fact that she didn't look into the bar for six days. <laughs> She's a very mysterious person, and your dad wonders if, now that she is no longer pickled, she will start to age like the rest of us. <laughs> Too hot to go on any longer. We love you, Mom. About the Dickens biography? Yes. Um, well, obviously, that's an interesting episode. And uh, let me just, for those of you who haven't read it, it's, it was a train, a bridge broke as Dickens was coming back from France. And the, tr and the first two cars of the train, or maybe more, felt, went over the edge. And Dickens' uh, car was hanging. And let's imagine it's swaying a little bit. And he was in the car with Ellen Turnan and her mother. Ellen was his secret mistress that nobody knew about. She apparently hurt her arm. So he, um, and, and the people in the first car, the cars that fell off completely, many people were very badly hurt. And so Dickens uh, made his way sort of bit by bit down the car and out, um, took care of Ellen and her mother, and then he went around with his hat full of water, giving water to people while they waited for some kind of help or rescue. And he helped watch people die, he helped people live. Um, and then when, when things had sort of sorted themselves out, he climbed back up into the car and um, retrieved his manuscript, which was um, of our mutual friend. Not the whole thing, but the part that he was writing uh, at that time. And, um, and then some months later when there was a, he was so nervous about being discovered uh, to have a mistress that when they were doing the inquiry in the train, <coughs> into the train wreck, <coughs> he used, he pulled a few strings so that he didn't have to appear and say what he'd done. <coughs> um, you know, he was such an interesting um, guy. The, the thing that interested me, I guess, or the thing that jumps into my mind right now, was his success in hypnotizing people. He came to believe that um, he could, that he came to know how to hypnotize people. And, and there was one woman that he hypnotized and he elicited Bad, some bad memories from her and then talk to her about them. And she swore that after that she, was, she never had the same nightmares again. 
he was an incredibly secretive person. And um, I guess that's another thing that sticks with me, too. You know, I've always had dogs. I had a lot of horses. But when I grew up and had horses as an adult, one of the things I noticed about them is that they were quite different from one another. And you could experience their individuality both with your mind by looking at them and with your body because every step they took was different from every step that this other horse took. And I wrote, I read a book, I wrote a book, excuse me, called um, A Year at the Races in which I devised a sort of Myers-Briggs type test that you could give your horse to see <laughs> what its personality was. But I've never known, I've known two horses that were a little similar, but I've never known two horses that have the same reactions to things and the same take on things. And some are quite smart, and, um, and some are quite dull, and some overreact, and, and they clearly have intentions. Um, I have a horse who, um, there's a particular mounting block with a lid that turns up like this. Every time she sees it, she goes over and flips the lid to see what's in it. <laughs> so I never, ever, 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 ever believed that they were dumb or that they didn't have feelings. I, I, I'm not sure that they have um, t uh, tremendous intelligence, but I know that they have a lot of feelings, that they are very attached to one another, that they recognize death. Um, and so that I just have kept watching them. And, um, and it's the same with the dogs, so. I like the money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't, um, I didn't like it or dislike it. I, I remember going to see it. They were nice to me. They let me come on set. I thought they, they did the best they could. Um, but it's not the movie I would have made. And when I went to see it, I, I, after it was over, I turned to my friend and said I was glad I was a novelist. Um, the person they approached to play the father first was Paul Newman, and he said, no way. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think the actors did the best they could, but um, it, there was some kind of, there's something too sober, I don't know, I don't know, but it, I didn't love it. Uh, Pardon me? Paul it? Can't even remember. Jason, Jason Robards, yeah. right. Yeah, Jason Robards was the father. Um, and Michelle Pfeiffer. Good, good. You guys are good. I actually like the Secret Lives of Dentists. They were horrible to me. They didn't even send me um, a free ticket. They kind of stole the rights, and then. Um, and then they didn't even send me a free ticket, but I liked it a whole lot. So that's made from um, The Age of Grief, and I like that one. Well, you know, when I was uh, just out of co college, maybe just out of graduate school, I decided that I was going to write an epic, a romance, a tragedy, and a comedy. <laughs> and. And then when I came to do Horse Heaven, I decided that the six horses, there was going to be an epic horse, a tragic horse, a romantic <laughs> horse, a comic horse, also a realistic horse, that's just a Bob, and a meta-realistic horse, that's Mr. T. And um, so since I've done these, I, I wouldn't say I attempted to put, I would say to, to notice what's similar about those would be bad. That would be something I wouldn't want. I wouldn't want you to notice any, any consistent theme except, you know, maybe something funny here and there. No, they're all fantastic and they're all very Thank you. Books and Thank you. Oh, it's only 6.39. I'm going to read another.
five minutes or so. Um, but what I'd want to do is for somebody in the audience to say a year. So from 1953 to 1986. So just shout out a year. 63. 64. 64. 64. Okay. We'll do some 64. See, I don't remember everything that happens, so it'll be a surprise to me as well as to you. Okay, this is from 64. Um, okay, so this is Andy. She, she's Frank's wife. And um, it says, and, and Dr. Smith is a Langian psychotherapist. You can imagine. Andy didn't go back to Dr. Smith right away. After that first appointment, she decided that he made her a bit nervous. Not exactly what he said, but the eyes, the posture, the hands. After JFK's assassination, there were only two time periods in the world now, before and after that event. She had started reading a book about frontal lobotomies. As far as Andy could understand it, the doctor lifted the patient's eyelid, pressed the point of an ice pick against the top of the eye socket, and drove it into the patient's brain with a hammer. Then he did it on the other side. Dr. Smith struck her as the sort of person who could comfortably do such a thing. <laughs> but Dr. Grossman was giving up on her. Dr. Grossman had consulted her mentor about Andy's lack of affect. Their only really good session had been as friends deploring the assassination, expressing a fear they shared that much more was going on in Washington and in the world than most people suspected. After that one, though, Dr. Grossman had gone back to being a professional, and Andy had begun to run out of tales to tell, either as dreams or as childhood experiences. She read about Freud's patient, Dora, and made the mistake of telling one of Dora's dreams as her own. <laughs> Dr. Grossman seemed to recognize it, though, as a dream, Andy thought it was fairly common, returning home after the death of her father, then getting lost, not nearly so interesting as dreaming that a guest came for dinner, ate more than his share, and then went out to the outhouse to relieve himself. When he was halfway to the outhouse, he suddenly swelled up to a monstrous size, jumped onto the roof of the house, and began riding the house like a horse, screaming and shaking the whole place. This dream, Dr. Grossman found trivial and without meaning. And so she returned to Dr. Smith. With the spring, he seemed healthier and not as depressed as he had in the fall. She wrote him a check for $500, 10 appointments in advance. The next thing she had to do was stand up against the wall in his office so that he could draw pictures of her, front, back, left side, right side. This took the whole of the first 50 minutes. At her next appointment, he laid the pictures on the table in his office. Over each of them, he had superimposed a grid, and by means of this grid, he diagnosed where and to what degree she was out of balance. For example, if she had disproportionately large hips, he would have diagnosed a blockage between her lower body and her upper body. For these women, the first step to a cure was to lift their shoulders and open their mouths wide and to make a habit of taking deeper and deeper breaths. As a result, they would eventually speak the truth about themselves. In Andy, the disproportion went the other way. She had broad shoulders and a prominent bust, but narrow hips, slender legs, and slender feet. She was barely, he said, connected to the earth and more important, to her sexuality. How often did she and her husband have sexual relations? Almost never, said Andy. And did she have sexual relations with other men? No, said Andy. Women? Andy shook her head. He took her over to the mat and had her sit cross-legged and close her eyes. He straightened her here and adjusted her there. It hurt. Then he had her think of sex and say five words. The five words she said were, shoe, earth, automobile, bath, and Kennedy. But she wasn't thinking of sex. Those were just the first words that came into her mind as she looked around his office and out the window. There was a long silence. She opened her eyes. The position was getting slightly more comfortable, and she took a deep breath. Just then, Dr. Smith sat down on the mat 
right in front of her, crossing his legs in an oriental position with his feet turned upward on his thighs and his knees flat on the mat. After a moment of silence, he leaned forward until their faces were almost touching and he enunciated the words, don't bullshit me, Andrea Langdon. I don't like it. His breath was sour. Andy jerked backward, but then she said, all right. They agreed to meet on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. <laughs> Okay, somebody say one other year. Oh, let's get out of the 70s. 85, yay, 85. Did anything interesting happen in 1985? That's the question. We'll find out. Not much. 1985. The day after Claire's divorce was finalized, the temperature was 30 below zero and her windows were rhymed with frost flowers. You guys can relate to this, right? <laughs> the streets of downtown Des Moines were slick and nearly empty and Yonkers was opening an hour late to give the employees time to get in. Paul had agreed to the divorce when he met Veronica, who was 27 and also a doctor. He had always laughed at the idea of women doctors, but Veronica confined herself to the appropriate field of gynecology. Also, she was petite, she had maintained an A average at Grinnell and at the University of Iowa College of Medicine. In other words, Claire thought it would take her 13 to 15 years to wake up and realize that she couldn't take it. She had considerable debt from college and medical school, and so it was fortunate for her that the family law judge had decided that half of Claire's inheritance from the sale of the farm should go to Paul. Claire was therefore down to about $150,000. Others were angry on her, to her behalf, most notably Lois and less passionately Minnie, but Paul was paying for Gray at Penn and Brad was headed for Haverford, which was at least on the East Coast. Brad's acceptance to Johns Hopkins had nearly caused Paul to ejaculate in ecstasy, according to Gray, but Brad adamantly refused to go there and Paul had had to settle for the nearest thing. Claire liked to think that he would also be spending a pretty penny of, their, of her money on the Valentine's Day wedding to Veronica, which was to take place at the ever desirable Wakanda Country Club and who would certainly be there but her former best friend Ruth. According to Gray, Ruth was, a bosom, but was bosom buddies with Paul and she had urged him to let her take back Veronica, to take Veronica in hand and give her advice on how to cook Paul's favorite dishes. Gray said, that <clears throat> said this in an ironic tone with his eyebrows raised in amusement. Claire thought that whatever it was she had done to damage her son's psyche, he seemed to express it in a stream, stream of jokes that were charming and rueful. He could not possibly have gotten his sense of humor from Paul, so she took credit for that. One day it said to her, do you, do you hate my dad? She had surprised herself by saying that she didn't. Of course she didn't. When he responded, I do sometimes, she had said, he does his best. And that was the tragedy, wasn't it? Just like Hamlet, just like Macbeth, just like Lear, he did his best. Claire thought it was funny that she had read all of those now, on her own, just sitting up in bed. And that was the point. Not that they were kings and princes and therefore grander than you or me, but that they made their own downfall by being who they were, something that even more tragically was not set in stone, according to the divorcees and the therapist she knew. So she did feel sorry for Paul now, and her hatred had left no tangible trace. Do I find it an easier writing process because I have this historical structure? No. The, every book I've ever written has had a structure because I like structure. So um, whatever the structure has been, whether this or whether um, 10 Days in the Hills is 10 days, um, based, but it's based on Boccaccio, on the Decameron, 
Um, so that gave me structure, 1,000 acres, King Lear gave me the structure. So I like to have a structure. I think that's very helpful. Um, it's very much like your scaffolding. But whether it's easy or hard um, is always dependent on other things. This, this was pretty good because, pretty easy, because it went year by year and I could just sort of, I could feel the energy just sort of building and I knew that was working. And the characters, they didn't come, they came not to seem like my um, creations. They came to seem like either family members or people on the train that I was eavesdropping on. They, they took on their own energy. Um, and quite often they would do things that I thought were really stupid. So I came to understand um, the combination of God and free will. Because I was their God and yet they had free will. <laughs> um, the hardest one was, uh, well let's, I guess the, the some have, some have been really quite easy, and in some ways the easiest one was the Greenlanders. Um, because once I got the voice, the, the amount of history that I had to learn was only a stack about that high. And once I got the voice and had read all the Icelandic sagas, then to sit down and write it was really like just putting on some other consciousness and having it be delivered. It was spooky. It was quite spooky. Um, and the hardest one is also one of my favorites, which is private life. And I didn't expect it to be hard. But then I realized that um, things that had happened to Margaret as a child would take away her ability to um, tell her own story. And so I had to tell her story in spite of her. So that was hard. And I also found her husband detestable. And so get, getting some kind of empathy for his point of view was also hard. So you never know which one's going to be hard and which one is going to be easy. Well, let's put it this way. I, I grew up in a really gossipy family. <laughs> and so there, were some, there was a box of pictures. My grandparents were born in 19, I mean 1890 and 19, 1898. So they're about the same age as Walter and Roseanne. They weren't farmers or anything. They'd had a pretty adventurous um, uh, early life. And then there were these five kids who were about the same age as these, but they are different genders. Um, and so the, the cousins and I would bring out the box of, of pictures and we'd get them going and they'd start telling us the stories. And so you'd be sitting in the living room and they'd tell you the story of how um, Aunt Frances and Aunt Jane, all, the whole time they were driving from Idaho to Texas because they'd lost the ranch and they had to find some other job and it was going to be in the oil business. But, Aunt, Aunt, but Frances and Jane, who were now six and four, couldn't stop fighting over who was going to have the doll and who was going to, so, so they'd tell you the story, we'd, we'd listen. Then you'd go into the kitchen to get a Pepsi and somebody, you'd run into one of the other ants and they'd say, that's not the way it happened. <laughs> and so you'd get an earful about what happened, what really happened. And there were always secrets. Great grandmother had told Aunt Jane things that she hadn't told mom, that she hadn't even told grandmother. Grandfather had told his sisters things that he hadn't told. So there were always secrets, there were always stories. And that's what I grew up in being interested in and listening to. And so the idea of being in a family where they have thoughts about one another, where they have stories to tell, where they have stories to keep secret, where um, it's just was how I was raised. This comes naturally to me. My husband um, and I, um, when, when we have different memories, he'll say, do you remember when we were in blah, blah? And I'll say, no, I don't remember places very well. But I'll say, do you remember that story about blah, blah? And he'll say, no. So I remember stories. So it wasn't hard to keep them, to keep them going and to keep the stories going. Also, once I set up 
their, um, okay, we've got to stop, but once I set up their temperaments and their personalities, then I had a good sense of who they were and off they went. What is my daily writing process? Um, for these books, it's been different for all the books, but for these books I decided I was going to write a thousand words a day for about the first four weeks, then 1250, then 1500, then 1750, and because I wanted the energy to build. Um, and some days it would take a long time because I'd have a lot of stuff to look up, and some days it, um, it would be easy because I'd know what I was doing. And I sort of didn't know ahead of time which it was going to be, but I'm, you know, I'm patient. I'm not a perfectionist. That's the thing that kills you as a novelist, is being a perfectionist. And I'm not. So I just keep going. Well, thanks a lot for coming. Thanks for the great question. She started screaming then, calling them every name in the book, shouting, TDC, TDC, threat, duress, and coercion, over and over again. Even as the female forced open the door and took hold of her by the left arm, and Kucha, good dog, faithful dog, went right at her. <laughs>